Hello, this is UCL Uncovering Politics, and this week we're looking at the politics of climate change. In particular, how should political institutions be designed to maximise action towards net zero? Hello, my name is Alan Rinnick, and welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics, the podcast of the School of Public Policy and Department of Political Science at University College London. Climate change is, as the article we're discussing this week puts it, the quintessential long-term problem. Action is needed to avert massive long-term harm, but the steps that are required will generate short-term costs. Democracies are famously short-termist. Politicians who want to be re-elected don't like imposing short-term costs on voters. So how can we design democracies better to foster longer time horizons? Well, that's the question that our article this week focuses on. The article is by my colleague, Dr. Jared Finnegan, who is lecturer in public policy here in the UCL Department of Political Science. And I'm delighted to say that Jared joins me now. Jared, welcome to UCL Uncovering Politics. And let's begin by digging a bit further into the problem that we're seeking to address here. Why is it so difficult for democracies to tackle climate change? Well, first off, thanks, Alan, for having me on uh, on on the podcast. Um, so, I would first start by saying that it's difficult for all political systems to address climate change. I mean, we see that uh, uh, around the world, um, countries, regardless of whether they're democratic or quasi-democratic or non-democratic, have trouble addressing climate change. And the main reason there, and we'll talk, I imagine, more about this today, is that. And you sort of mentioned this in your introductory remarks, but you know the key challenge is costs. It costs um, money, and, and some, some, and oftentimes a lot of money, to transition economies away from, uh, especially fossil fuel-based energy. And so governments have to find a way to impose these costs on society. And that's difficult, in, in, regardless of the political system. Um, and then part of that is that the benefits that society sort of gets for those costs are diffuse, they're in the future, they're public goods, et cetera, which makes the calculation even more difficult. Um, Democracies are uh, arguably uh, even, have an even tougher time. And you were, and again, you sort of alluded to this in your introductory remarks. I mean, imposing costs in democracies is difficult because consumers of goods are also voters. And so politicians can face voter backlash if they increase the price of goods, especially goods that are widely consumed, like energy, you know, petrol, electricity, et cetera, natural gas. And there can also be business backlash. And so you imagine you try to incentivize or coerce business to change its ways. And business is very powerful and can mobilize, um, can launch PR campaigns, uh, you know, all types of campaigns to try to influence the political debate and also you know, depose the government uh, and sometimes to try to get the government kicked out of office. Um, so that, that's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, also, it tends to be a low salience issue, unfortunately. Um, for, for me, you know, there are many things on the political agenda at any one time. Long-term problems like climate change, sort of slow burn issues often not don't rise to the top. Sometimes they do. We're actually we're in a period now where climate is quite salient, but that wasn't always the case. And then there are sort of you know, additional issues like time and consistency, where governments elected today might say they want to do something about the problem, but when the next government comes to power in five years or 10 years, uh, they decide they actually are not that worried about climate change or something else has become uh, more important uh, from their perspective. And so you get things like policy reversal, you know, where they change the policy or, or, or just totally um, reverse it. Great. Thank you. That's, that's a really clear starting point. So in the article, you look at whether we can design democracies better in order to overcome this challenge. And I guess I want to start off by understanding what are, what are the beginning hunches that you began with in doing this research and thinking about how it might be possible to do democracies better? You know, so th- this this paper is actually part of my PhD. It was one of the papers of my PhD. So I've been working on these ideas for, for quite a long time. So if I can remember all the way back to, to when I, I first started. I mean, I guess the starting point was just the variation we observed across the high in what I call the high income democracies. Other people call them the advanced industrialized countries. But it's basically the kind of 21 original sort of OECD members, but, but countries that are democratic and, and also high income. And 
what we see is actually a lot of variation across this set of countries. And a lot of the literature on climate politics up until recently would talk about all the ways or discuss all the ways that, um, that all, the, all the things that make climate difficult for governments to address. But actually, when we looked at what governments were doing, it was a bit more complicated. There were some governments doing a lot and other governments doing very little. And indeed, even in countries like the U.S., which is a case I know well, there were efforts by successive U.S. governments starting in the early 90s to really try to address climate change. It was The problem was that they were running into roadblocks. And in some contexts, politicians were able to overcome these roadblocks. And in other countries like the U.S., again, the roadblocks are still there. I mean, in the U.S., there's basically still no real federal climate policy. So the question there is why? Why is that the case? Why do we see this variation? You know, classic social science uh, question. And so I want to build some theory from the ground up. And so what I first try to do in the article is reconceptualize what the problem of, of climate change um, means for governments. And, and the, the short story there is that it means imposing short-term costs on society for benefits that mainly arrive in the long term. And this is difficult, for, again, for the reasons we've talked about. Um, you know, oftentimes, if you're going to you know, increase taxes, for example, on voters, they want something in return relatively quickly. Or they want to at least see that their uh, money is being you know, used to provide um, uh, some sort of public good or social service, or indeed the idea is that that would make the politics easier. And you don't necessarily get that in, with, with climate. Uh, indeed, I mean, governments that successfully address uh, climate change, we basically see no change from the status quo of today. I mean, if we're really successful in addressing the problem, nothing will change. And so people and businesses pay a lot of money and then nothing changes. And again, that, that makes the politics more difficult. And so the idea was then to think about the necessary conditions. So what might be or the sort of key enabling conditions in democracies that enable or allow or facilitate governments to address long-term challenges? And again, climate is just one of these. I mean, there are many different types of long-term challenges. You know, I focus on climate, but there are others working on things like infrastructure investment or you know, other kinds of sort of long-term challenges. The idea, I mean, the idea I had, but this was informed by work by others that have been working in this field, like Alan Jacobs in particular. But the idea I had was that things like electoral safety are crucial for governments to, to address long-term challenges like climate change, but also uh, the capacity of, of governments to overcome and diffuse business opposition. So I thought, okay, these are sort of two important conditions, uh, you know, theoretically for governments to be able to address the, a problem like climate change. And then I'm, I'm interested in institutions more broadly. So I start thinking about the way that institutions might be able to structure um, uh, these conditions. And in the case of electoral safety, that basically means, you know, can governments withstand some backlash from voters? I mean, do they have enough kind of electoral room to maneuver that if they do something that perhaps is unpopular in the short term, um, you know, can they withstand that? And uh, there's a lot of existing research in literature on the way that um, electoral rules shape uh, or may have an effect on electoral safety. And, and one of the key mechanisms is that basically uh, under proportional representation or PR, um, governments face lower levels of electoral competition, which means that uh, you know, for a small change in, in, in their vote share after an election, it's less likely that they'll be removed from office. And that's a really important piece, right? And so that we can think about that as sort of providing kind of an additional layer of insulation for politicians elected under PR, that uh, politicians elected in you know, two-party, first-past-the-post systems, or you know, mainly two-party systems, uh, like the UK, for example, but also Canada, Australia, uh, um, uh, the U.S., New Zealand. Well, New Zealand's actually changed its rules, um, but but you know many of the other English-speaking democracies. Um, and so that's that's the first piece is the way that electoral rules can can mediate or moderate the level of electoral safety that politicians enjoy. And then um, on the second piece about the conditions that enable governments to diffuse business opposition. One key set of institutions that I'm interested in, and I think have actually a really important role to play when it comes to climate politics, 
are the institutions that shape interest group intermediation or the state business relationship or the way in which uh, there's bargaining and interaction and negotiation between government and, and industry. And in some countries, you have very close relationships between um, what are called peak associations for business or, or you know, large employer associations for business and the government as well as um, uh, large encompassing labor unions in the government. And, and what happens is what's called tripartite bargaining, um, where you have governments in constant negotiation, again, with business and with labor about the direction of economic policy. And those countries are called corporatist countries, and we mainly find those in Northern Europe. And then in some countries, you have, very, you have arm, arm's length relationships between business and the state. And so you don't have uh, business doesn't have privileged access. Business isn't highly organized. And so you have oftentimes it's much more likely to see sort of one off bargaining by a firm or a collection of firms for sort of, you know, small changes in the law or kind of quid pro quo um, uh, types of deals, like especially you see in the U.S. And that's a very different interest group environment. Um, and that we, we call that pluralism interest group pluralism in, in political science. That's a very different environment, institutional environment than, than, than corporatism. And the basic idea is that under corporatist arrangements, um, it should be easier for governments to negotiate compensation with business. And, and I think compensation is really the key to diffusing business opposition. And again, we see this empirically, and we can talk more about the empirical results, but the point is, is when governments are able to ease the burden of adjustment for business, uh, we tend to see, um, uh, or theoretically, we should see business playing along um, with, with a decarbonization agenda. But when government is, for some reason, uh, unable to reach a kind of compensatory agreement with business, there, in those circumstances, we should see business much more, uh, much more opposed, much more willing to fight uh, climate policy tooth and nail. Um, and again, we, I expect under corporatist arrangements that, that governments and business will find it easier to reach some reach some settlement. Great. So we've got those two kind of theoretical mechanisms there. We've got one to do with uh, the electoral system and the degree to which those in power are insulated from electoral competition if they do things that are unpopular in the short term. And the, we've got the other to do with uh, the degree of corporatism in the in the relationship between the state and particularly business uh, and the relationship between that and the ability of the state to compensate losers uh, for actions that are costly in the short term. So that's the theory. Um, and you seek to test out that theory against uh, some empirical evidence. So we always like a, a little bit of uh, discussion of methodology on this uh, podcast. Always a good thing. Um, how have you sought to go about testing? The theory against evidence. The first, you know, the first step is to so so. I'm, again, I'm interested in you know cross national variation. So again, explaining or answering questions like why does Denmark lead when it comes to climate and countries like the U.S. lag so far behind, and so those questions are quite difficult to answer for a number of reasons. Um, one is that, especially when you're interested in the role of institutions. Um, there are issues, methodological issues like omitted variable bias, where the institution you're interested in is correlated with a number of other factors that are sort of occurring at the country level. So it's hard to tease out the role of institutions. Um, and we could talk more about that um, if, if, um, if you're interested, Alan. But, but what I do initially, the first step is to collect a valid measure of what I conceptualize as climate policy investment. And so this is a measure of the extent to which governments are imposing costs on society today to generate long-term climate stability. And so I think about these as investments, and I actually think this is the way that we should start talking about climate policy is, is, uh, is as investment. So if, even if you think about a carbon tax, um, a carbon tax increases the price of, of some goods and services today, but you can think about that price increase as an investment for future climate stability. So the data I collect on, on cl uh, climate policy investment or climate policy stringency is uh, data from Altheimer and Hill, two environmental economists that have developed a data set on uh, at the sector level 
which measures um, the cost that government policies impose on business and on and on household sectors, so on consumer sectors. For I look at eighteen country, eighteen high income democracies. That that's what they have, the data set covers between nineteen ninety five in 2009. So that's my the outcome I'm interested in. That's that's the dependent variable. And then I collect um, uh, data on the two institutions that I'm interested in. And so one is uh, measuring electoral rules. And I do that using an index of electoral disproportionality, which is quite a common measure of electoral rules. And then um, for measuring corporatism, I measure one piece of corporatism. Corporatism is an umbrella term. It oftentimes uh, covers a number of different concepts or, or sort of factors or variables. Um, but I take one piece of it, which is called concertation. And concertation is basically the extent to which business and labor unions are uh, routinely involved in government policymaking. And so I collect that data from a really great existing database on trade unions and business out of the University of Amsterdam. Um, and then I... Um, as, as people will see in the paper, I do some very simple scatter plots where I um, just simply see if there was a relationship between electoral rules and climate policy, uh, climate policy investments. And indeed, we, I see, we see quite a strong relationship. And then to test that in more detail, as I mentioned it, it sort of just a second ago, I mean, there are a lot of other things that could be driving that relationship. And so we want to know as social scientists that What's actually doing the work is the, the variables that, that, that I theorize as being important. And so I try to do a number of additional tests to show that it actually is electoral rules that are driving, driving um, this relationship with, with climate policy investment. And then I do the same thing in the case of, of concertation. So I look at the relationship, a very simple scatter plot, the relationship between concertation and policy investment. Um, and and I see the predicted relationship. I guess I should mention that. So what I find is that countries with very close relationships between business and the government have the highest levels of, of climate policy investment, and countries where you have these much looser uh, relationships, these countries tend to do much less when it comes to climate change. And the same with PR rules. We see that countries with PR rules have higher levels of climate policy investment or policy stringency. And then I go through and do a, you know, a number of additional tests. A, a key one is to look at the kind of distributional impact, especially of electoral rules, because I theorize that under PR, we should expect governments to impose higher costs on consumers relative to producers. And that comes out quite nicely in the data. Um, and so, uh, so there's a number of analyses like that. And then lastly, one thing I want to touch on, which um, which is important um, is I think one interesting result is the extent to which um, compensation, and I develop an, a measure of compensation in the paper, but what I find quite strongly is that it, it's been the governments that have done the most to address climate change. So for example, Denmark, these are countries that have basically shifted the burden, shifted the cost onto households and away from industry. And that's exactly something we would expect theoretically, uh, given the the institutional the institutions uh, in Denmark. So PR electoral rules, high levels of concertation. We see this very particular distributive bargain that underlies kind of Denmark's leadership status. And when governments can't get this distributive bargain going, they tend to lag behind. Fantastic. That's a really helpful summary. Thank you, Jared. So um, we've got those hypotheses that proportional system, electoral systems and more corporatist systems are going to lead to stronger climate action. And essentially, that is what you find. And you were talking there about the fact that you you don't just look at those overall correlations, but you also try to get into some of the underlying causal mechanisms that are operating here and demonstrate that the, the me mechanisms that you hypothesized are the ones that are really working. And I guess that's that's really important for us here because um, so essentially when you're talking about these various different systems, as, as you kind of hinted at, um, we're, we're talking about quite different kinds of democracy, if you like. And sometimes we refer to these types of democracy as, as majoritarian democracies on the one hand, with, um, with uh, first past the post electoral systems and a tendency towards single party governments and you know power quite concentrated in the hands of the winners from an, an, an election. 
And on the other hand, what we have, what we, we sometimes call consensus democracies, where there are coalition governments, there's much more uh, concertation between government and interest groups, there's much more cooperation uh, between a variety of different actors in producing policy. And so if I understand it correctly, what you find is that the latter countries, the more, more uh, consensus-based countries, are better at uh, introducing measures to tackle climate change than are the majoritarian countries. And I mean, I guess the question is, well, is that really for the reasons that you're offering? And just to take a kind of an extreme alternative, one could think that, well, maybe there are just big underlying differences between majoritarian democracies and consensus democracies that have caused them to be majoritarian or consensus democracies in the first place. So it's not that these institutions are actually the things that are making the real difference here. So can we be really confident that, um, that it's those institutional differences that are driving the different outcomes? Yeah, it's such a good question, Alan. And, and you're right to point out that we tend um, to think about sort of, you know, one, you know, on the one hand, majoritarian democracies as being quite different than, than consensus democracies. I think that's actually an important point to kind of reiterate, especially for any listeners that aren't political scientists or students of political science. Um, you know, democracies vary quite a bit institutionally. I mean, you can have democracies that are equally democratic when it comes to uh, measures of democracy, but actually the way they um, uh, sort of the way the democracy sort of operates institutionally is quite different. And there are, again, these, these two um, kind of ideal types, majoritarian and, and consensus. To try to answer your question you know, directly, what I try to do in the paper, I'll, I'll give kind of two sets of answers. One is kind of nitty gritty with the data, and then I'll try to be a bit more conceptual and, and theoretical. So in terms of the data, I try to run a battery of tests to show that it is these mechanisms that are driving the relationship. And so in the case of electoral rules, you're absolutely right. We might say that, well, countries that have proportional representation are sort of different in some way. You know, so cut, for example, a country like Sweden, which has had proportional representation since the early part of the uh, uh, 20th century, we might say, you know, that's, it's somehow Sweden is very different uh, than a country like the UK, which has had uh, majoritarian rules. Um, uh, since the early 20th century, actually in the, U, in the case of the UK, since the 19th century. So how do we know that it's, it's these mechanisms of electoral safety that are driving the results? And so one thing I do is I collect additional measures of um, these two mechanisms. So one is electoral competition. And the idea is that when governments face less competitive elections, they're more likely to be able to think past the next election because they have higher levels of electoral safety. So this should be more likely to address long-term challenges. So I collect data on that. And I also collect data on something you mentioned, which is one single party governments. And the idea is that with the single party government, they're gonna be more risk averse to imposing costs on voters because voters can easily identify them and sanction them. And so what we see, first of all, I see, okay, well, under PR, do we see elections, um, are elections less competitive? Yes, I find that. Then I say under then I then I ask well under PR do we find there are more multi-party governments more coalitional governments um, than single-party ones and yes I find that and then I say okay now electoral competition should be associated with climate policy investment and so should sing, single-party governments and I find that and so I try to trace the causal chain so what I find is that indeed in countries that are majoritarian we we they have more competitive elections and less stringent climate policy than under PR, where you have less competitive elections and more, um, uh, and more stringent policy. And the, case, the same with single party governments. What I find quite strikingly is that single party governments do less when it comes to you know, strong climate policy. And the, the reason for that, I argue, is because these governments are much more likely to take the blame you know, they're much more likely to be held count accountable than if you have a multi-party government who can kind of blame shift, et cetera. Um, and in the case of concertation, it's a bit different because I have a, a quite a narrow measure of, of concertation. So um, I rely on that as sort of the key, the key mechanism. And then I also do some within country analysis in the case of, 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 of concertation and corporatism, which holds up. But 
to, to think more broadly for a second, it's a real challenge when you study institutions, which is something I'm interested in. And I think institutions really matter when it comes to politics. And they're often an understudied thing uh, uh, these days, especially because it's very hard to identify their effects because they don't change very often. So there are a number of, of ways that, uh, you know, in some of my more recent work that I'm trying to get it at this, you know, at this question methodologically. Um, for example, using um, different exogenous shocks that, and to see if they affect different countries differently depending on their institutions. So that's as in, as in su- sudden things that emerge from outside the system, sudden changes that, that uh, kind of disrupt what's happening. And so you can l- look at the, how the system responds to, to those events. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, for example, I'm working on a project now looking at the way that the 1970s, the oil price shocks of the 1970s, sort of filtered through domestic institutions and how then that shaped different policy outcomes. Um, but I think at the end of the day, your, your critique or, your, or, or the, the, the kind of viewpoint you're laying out is valid. So how do we know that it is institutions like electoral rules that are driving this and not some other um, confounding variable, some other variable that we can't measure that, that, that's driving it? And I think again, you know, all we can try to do, and it's a very serious question that, that someone, you know, that all of us that work on institutions need to take very seriously. But I think the best we can do is a battery of different tests and try to be quite creative in how we, in how we approach uh, and test the effects of, uh, of these institutions. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And I guess one other crucial question for policymakers, I guess, is... Um, not just about the direction of the effect and whether there is an effect, but also how big the effect is. So, sh- you know, should climate activists really care that, that they must get a proportional electoral system and the most proportional electoral system available, uh, because that's something that will really make a big difference to outcomes? Or are there potentially other factors that are more important? And just how, how important are the, the points that you find in your article relative to potential other determinants of the... Um, the extent of climate action taken by governments? I'm not wholeheartedly proposing that if a country was to suddenly change its electoral rules, um, that would somehow have a quite quick and dramatic effect on climate policy. I don't think that would be the case for a number of reasons. One, and that probably is perhaps the most important one, is that it takes time for politicians to adjust to the new incentives under a different institutional environment. They have to learn that they that they can get you know get away with imposing more costs on, on voters right and that and that takes time and so you wouldn't see this immediate effect. Um, one project I hope to do is look at the case of New Zealand. And so New Zealand s- switches from a very you know first past the post um, you know kind of very strictly Westminster model uh, in ninety four ninety six I forget exactly. You probably know Alan, but I forget exactly the, um, the 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 first election under the new system was in ninety six. Yeah, ninety six. Thank you. Um, and so I'd like to see. This is kind of one thing on you know on my. I eventually get to this, but we should expect over the decades. Now there's been you know twenty five plus years under the new rules. We should start to see um, you know changes in prices basically, and I mean we would predict that prices that they'd be able to, that the governments would be able to impose you know higher higher costs on voters than under majoritarian rules um, so i wouldn't so my advice for climate activists um, wouldn't be to 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 push to to put sort of i think electoral reform is important for other reasons i think pr um, um, there are a number of reasons why we might prefer PR to majoritarian rules for a number of reasons. I know, Alan, um, you, you work a lot on this. Um, but for climate activists, I think the, you know, a, a different approach, which I think might be more fruitful, is to think about the types of policies that governments could de- design that would fit with the institutional environment in the country. And so especially for us that are from the laggard countries, you know, me being from the United States, I tried to think about what kinds of policies would work given the institutional environment in the United States. And and in terms of imposing costs on voters, that's going to be very difficult. But one thing that you might be able to do that might work is to get the benefits to flow back to voters quite quickly. And if you're doing a carbon tax, one way to do that is to provide a rebate 
to households quite quickly. So you impose a, a, ta- a new tax on them, but then you provide some revenue. Um, uh, you know, part of the revenue from that tax is recycled back to households. And that's what Canada did. And there's been a lot of uh, efforts to try to remove that, that carbon pricing policy in Canada, but so far it's held. And that's in a majoritarian, you know, first past the post system. And so I think moving to questions of policy design, given the institutional environment in a particular country, uh, is important. In terms of the size of the effect, so in the paper, I have some kind of estimates of the size. And what we do see is that um, uh, um, the effect of, of moving from a sort of purely proportional system to a purely majoritarian one is quite large. The effect is quite significant. But I think that's only part of the story. And indeed, those estimates you know, might be biased for a number of reasons, might not be the most you know, we might, we might not want to sort of put too much on those given the methodological issues that we talked about earlier. But I think more broadly speaking, I think institutions are the most important thing that is driving climate politics. And and again, the way electoral rules, I mean, one, one piece of the puzzle is imposing costs uh, on households, on voters, but also the, the, the incentives that electoral rules um, generate for governments to think short term versus long term across a whole range of issues, the way that electoral rules can drive polarization in different ways. I mean, the fact the way that these institutions can affect a whole range of outcomes that then have spillover effects to climate, I think is very important. And it's the same thing on, on the business side in terms of how states and governments interact with business. That whole has a whole range of of, of outcomes that spill over and affect climate. Our, our time is short, alas, but let me try to squeeze in one final question because I think it's, it's quite important. So um, I think some people might say that part, it sounds like part of your proposal for addressing democracy's problem with short time horizons is essentially to limit democracy, to insulate decision making from citizens' preferences. And some people might find that normatively rather problematic. I just wonder how you would respond to that. Yeah, and, and this is an important question, and and I think the way I think about it is it goes back to conceptions of democracy, and there is one conception, especially in the English-speaking world, which is that democracy is about accountability, basically. So what democracy means is that if you don't like what the government does now in the short term, you should be able to remove them from office very quickly, and again, that's the kind of normative underpinnings of the um, of the majoritarian model that that in the English speaking world um, we tend to tend to subscribe to, but another view of democracy, much more sort of a continental view or northern European view, is that um, democracy should be represent you know representative, right? That we should seek to have uh, to to that we should we should sort of the goal is to have democracy represent a wide variety of interests. So that means even the interests of those who didn't necessarily win the election. So those that do want very stringent climate policy or future generations or other social actors being brought into the process. So that's, that's, that's one piece of it. Um, I don't think that climate policy in particular, because of the significant distributive consequences of climate policy, and that's to say, because of the significant ways that decarbonization from now until the end of the century is going to change and redistribute costs and benefits in society. I don't think that it should be fully insulated from uh, from voter preferences. And so there are some, especially economists, climate economists, who will say, well, we need to have something like a cent- independent central bank that basically sets climate policy and governments can't touch it. I think that will be tremendously problematic for a number of reasons. Um, one, on normative grounds, but also I think that people <laughs> won't like that and you'll face a massive political backlash. So the question is not fully, it's not about fully insulating governments, but it is about, um, and maybe I don't want to make a normative claim here. It's more of a political economy claim, which is just to say that what we do see is that when governments have a little bit more electoral slack, they're able to be much more ambitious when it comes to um, um, climate policy. And so finding ways, you know, pockets of insulation for governments to do things that are quite radical, which in the end, you know, in, in the future will generate a lot of benefits, but in the short term does generate costs. You know, 
insulation, finding ways to insulate them, um, um, you know, is important. But again, we, we should always be mindful of, 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 the, of the sort of normative consequences of that or some other unforeseen negative consequences of that. And I guess a lot of climate activists at the moment are focusing more on uh, trying to strengthen the democratic process through things like citizens' assemblies, for example, trying to encourage more discussion, more public discussion, um, in order, I suppose, to try to um, develop a political debate around these issues that has longer time horizons, that is more focused upon uh, the long-term consequences of action. And I guess that's that's entirely compatible, isn't it, with, with what you're proposing? It's not like uh, it's an either-or uh, set of decisions that we need to make about how to pursue these issues. Yeah, I think this is this is an an important question, and I don't necessarily think they're that they are incompatible. Um, of course, it depends on the you know the specific context that, and how exactly a citizens' assembly is designed and and who's involved, etc. But I think in principle, they they do offer ways of of getting citizens involved in a sort of more democratically robust way. Um, that said, the extent to which they can shape long-term thinking and sort of keeping governments on a long-term trajectory, I think is still, you know, still remains to be seen. I mean, we might think from basic collective action theory that having many more voices and many more actors in the decision-making process will make it even more difficult to reach um, some sort of agreement. Um, but then again, it, it may be the case that through deliberation and through engagement with fellow citizens that, uh, that people change their mind um, and, and are willing to support long-term government action to address climate change. But I guess one key thing to think about and, and one, one key variable here would be the extent to which these citizens' assemblies are routinized and happen you know, every, every year or every other year this is really what we need. I mean, we need constant pressure on governments over the next, I mean, you know, indefinitely, basically, to address the problem. So the extent to which citizens' assemblies can galvanize that pressure, I think, will be a key determinant, to, you know, in terms of how they're able to affect long-term governance. Well, thank you so much, Jared. This is a conversation that we could easily keep going for quite a lot longer. It's such an important subject and uh, a really valuable contribution that you've made in this article. So, um, yeah, thank you for coming on the podcast. The, the article that we've been discussing is called Institutions, Climate Change and the Foundations of Long-Term Policymaking. It's by Jared J. Finnegan and it's published in the journal Comparative Political Studies. So far, it's available in the online first section. And we'll put all of those details, of course, in the show notes for this episode. Next week, we're looking again at the impact of electoral systems. We'll be asking, does proportional representation enable better representation for women? As ever, to make sure you don't miss out on that or other future episodes of UCL Uncovering Politics, all you need to do is subscribe. You can do so on Apple, Google Podcasts or whatever podcast provider you use. I'm Alan Reddick. Our producer is Abby Turner. Our theme music is written and performed by John Mann. This has been UCL Uncovering Politics. Thank you for listening.